Hey traders, we're going to check in on the charts and the markets here in just a moment. The second half of this video, I'm going to be talking about how being good at technical analysis is different than being good at trading with some of my own personal examples today where I just missed a whole bunch. And before we get into that, we've got chart guys Lamont putting out some nice content about playing stop hunts with some nice examples, video, and all that good stuff. Link in the comments of this video. Lamont is the gentleman behind the swing report that the chart guys have here, and he does a whole good job, a whole bunch of good jobs, uh, updating the plays and, and incorporating lessons along the way. So check out that link for more useful educational information. So S&P 500, we got our daily bounces. We started scouting for them yesterday. They started showing up and they followed through today. So now what? Well, now we watch hourly uptrends on all of our individual names and ETFs because we know a loss of the hourly uptrend is the first indication that a daily lower high is forming. We're also going to be watching what is the retracement size of this bounce. Is it weak and a bear flag that results in a lower low? Or is it a 50% plus retracement that lasts another couple of days that then gives the bulls a chance to establish a potential two-week higher low? Again, I keep referring to this chart over the last month because we are either going to, well, there's three things. We're either going to straight drop to a lower low, which would require a confirming of the daily downtrend. We are going to confirm the first two-week uptrend since we topped out at all-time highs, which will then be the first major indication of a long-term bottom being set for me. And the third scenario is we just tighten up for a while and then wait for a break, Q1 2023. So what we saw last time this happened, again, was a weekly higher low formed or a two-week higher low. We failed the high, and then we rolled over. And when we rolled over there, that was a convincing win for the bears for me. So same thing. We'll see how this shapes up. This current candle is nine days left to go. So it takes a while for these charts to shape up. But it's anybody's game for me. The Bears made a big statement on their CPI and FOMC reaction. But for the Bears, for me, for the Bears to gain a significant amount of advantage, it's got to be this downtrend. And the analogy that I keep giving, I'm going to give it one more time. Last time. The Bears sucker punched the Bulls in the mouth. The Bulls were stunned and staggered back. And yesterday, the Bulls said, all right, punk, you want to fight? Let's do this. And so now the bulls are fighting back. And so the bears are either going to overpower the bulls a second time now that they are ready to throw down, or the bulls are going to be able to shake off that sucker punch, keep control to a 50% plus bounce retracement to give themselves space for a daily higher low attempt once we top out. So the next two trading days are very key for me. We either see continuation or we top out. And Bulls had a good day today. I had a checklist, a mental checklist of all the things that the Bulls needed to accomplish for me to believe them today. We had all major sectors at the high of the day at the same time again today. We had Apple and Amazon break the highs of yesterday. A Amazon took its sweet time, but it eventually broke those highs of yesterday. And I forget what else. We had, we had XLF breaking a triple top at 33.80, which was a key little resistance level. But we got fairly quickly information on the morning saying bulls are still running the show here the first five minute candle it was uh -oh, a little dicey but over the next 15 20 minutes of the morning we knew the bulls were looking for that bounce follow through so measure those retracement sizes on all individual names and sectors right now the s p 500 is still a potential bear flag the simple statement is if we cannot get over daily ema 12 resistance it's a daily bear flag this is why we need this bounce to last multiple days if the bulls are going to give themselves a chance here NASDAQ, same deal, but weaker. The NASDAQ must start leading these moves for the bulls. NASDAQ is not close to the 382 retracement. It is still a potential daily bear flag. And QQQ divided by SPY shows us we're not leading here. QQQ is not leading the way up. We know that a bull market is QQQ leading the way up. And ever since we saw weakness in the broader market, it's been QQQ leading the way down. 
So I have to see this chart bounce for multiple days and it is lagging behind. The broader market is clearly bounces underway on the daily. The QQQ divided by SPY ratio or correlation, whatever you want to call it, is not seeing that bounce yet. That has to happen. We need our generals, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, to step up. Microsoft, weak bounce. We need more. We'll give the bulls a chance. Again, it's, you know, they had a great day today. It takes days for this to play out. Amazon's really the one that's that's the dead weight right now. Amazon's got to get its act together. We're coming off the fear, a new fear low. And when I say fear low, I mean the lowest level we've seen in months or potentially all year. That's a fear low as opposed to just a low. But Amazon, get it together if we're going to believe that the NASDAQ bulls can lead any kind of bullish move. The dollar is still range bound. That's another factor. If the dollar breaks bull here, how do equities respond? We've seen the correlation between the dollar and equities significantly diminish. They were tick for tick inversely correlated for a significant amount of time. And then CPI and FOMC reactions threw those correlations out the window. And so I'm watching to see, does the dollar, if the dollar breaks bull, does that add downward pressure on equities? Tesla, if you told me that the broader market would bounce, if you show me the daily chart from Tesla yesterday and what has happened the last couple of weeks, and if you tell me daily RSI is this beat up, four hour RSI is this beat up, but the broader market's gonna go plus one and a half percent tomorrow, both the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. And if you told me that Tesla would underperform the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, I would say there is a very, very, very low probability that happens. 5% or less, and it happened today. That tells me there is still a lot of downward pressure. There's still a lot of shares being sold here. A lot of people, you know, people saying it's not Musk because we're in a blackout period. That may be the case. But again, this is, for me, this is big money. This is not retail locking in, you know, end of year losses. Because again, the dollar volume is just, it's just speculating. I'm just speculating off my experience, but it looks to me like big money is exiting Tesla we know, we know Musk was part of that big money exiting Tesla a week or two ago, but it's still happening. For you to not see shorts cover and a significant oversold bounce on today's kind of market day, you've got to have a significant amount of selling pressure still underway. Hourly EMA 12 is really tough for the bulls. We're just grinding and rejecting. The bulls showed up today, second half of the day, failed the high of the day, just an hourly lower high. So now we got an hourly equilibrium. We got the low, high of the day, higher low, lower high, right in the middle of the range into the close. And we have to break the stair step pattern of a lower high every single day for any kind of bounce to take place. Keeping in mind, bears are patiently waiting for a daily lower high. There's tons of space for it to form with EMA 12 resistance, 10% to the upside. So keeping a close eye on whether or not bulls can shift. And if you look at Tesla divided by QQQ, you will see that that relative weakness returned very quickly. You have to see this chart going up along with Tesla. We just closed the weakest that Tesla has been comparative to the NASDAQ in a very long time. This has to, we have to see relative strength to show us that shorts are covering. At no point today, again, put yourself in in both schools of thought. If you're bullish, Imagine what you would be thinking if you're a bear. And if you're bearish, imagine what you'd be thinking if you're a bull. And so when I'm looking at this bounce this morning, and I'll go over this trade more in depth here at the end of this video, one of my right but wrong scenarios, at no point do bears have anything to worry about. Look at the drop yesterday and look at the bounce this morning. And that's where we topped out. If you shorted yesterday at any point in the first four or five hours of the day, you didn't come close to getting underwater today. You've got to put recent bears underwater to force short covering. At no point today was there any pressure on shorts to cover. Bull volume is missing. Or really, it's just bear volume is overwhelming bull volume. We will bounce on the daily, but not yet. Semiconductors NVDA daily bounces underway. Bears are hoping for a head and shoulders to form here. Anything under 187.90 is a lower high. We've got a lot of space to work with for the bears. 
retracement size. So from where we closed today, or let's just go from the high. From the high of today, we can go another 2% higher and still be a potential daily bear flag. So if these bulls are gonna to start to negate a daily bear flag, we've got to go 4% over the high of yesterday, or high of today, I should say. So there's still a lot of work to do. One green bounce day is great, but it's gotta be multiple. Netflix, daily bounce, right off 382, but the fact that it's even testing 382 shows me it's one of the stronger bounces. And again, bigger picture, the weekly uptrend is going to remain strong for bulls here unless bears confirm the daily downtrend. Losing the daily uptrend is a great start, but we must confirm daily downtrends for bears to have confidence, which is why, we, why I keep talking about it. We're watching the same thing for the vast majority of the market right now. Charts are mixed up here. Let's go healthcare. So healthcare daily bounce underway, retracement size, yada, yada. You get the idea. Hourly uptrend is our guide. When we lose the hourly uptrend, the daily lower high is shaping up. We had a daily uptrend for months. We lost the daily uptrend. We are no longer, is, you ask me, is the healthcare sector in a daily uptrend? No. Is it in a daily downtrend? No. We have to confirm the lower high and lower low to be in a daily downtrend. So we're in this ambiguous zone Waiting to see who's going to take control here. The bulls and the bears are squaring up. Who's going to come out on top? The healthcare sector is at 382 retracement. Nope, the financial sector is at 382 retracement as well. One of the be better bounces for our major sectors right now. And if we get up towards that 50% retracement, we start creating the space for an eventual daily trend change attempt to have a chance Hourly uptrend is our guide. IWM, daily bounce, one of the leaders today, but again, still a lot of work to do on that retracement. If we're red tomorrow in the markets, it's gonna be, uh-oh, we need to be cautious of bear flags. It's not gonna mean the bounce is over. It depends on how it shapes up, how significant a bear day it is. Essentially, if you're a bear at this point and you want those lower highs to form and you wanna roll over, to confirm daily downtrends, you're itching to see all major sectors, QQQ, XLF, XLV, all hitting low of the day at the same time. We did that multiple times since CPI. We've now seen bulls at the high of the day all together multiple times on the bounce. So we're going to be watching when's the next time it happens again for the bears. And even this entire bounce, I was watching for it and it just never came. All major sectors hitting the low of the day at the same time did not happen much at all during this you know, one month stretch there. So keeping a close eye on that factor because it has significant implications on a day-to-day -day basis when it happens or not. And again, just directionally, you can look at it and say, if all major sectors hit the high of the day at the same time, I'm just not gonna look bearish today. There was a little bit of bear opportunity today, but Again, if you want to be looking in the correct direction overall, that's a nice little, little cheat sheet to be using to ensure that you're not fighting short-term momentum. The metals are staying strong with the dollar staying under daily EMA 12. There is still a potential rising wedge. Again, I'm not being an aggressive bear on the metals. I'm watching for if the dollar gets over daily EMA 12 resistance, I might look to short either metals or miners. But in the absence of that, I'm just observing. And so gold is a double top. But again, it's still holding on well, all things considered. And silver broke to a higher high, but no follow through. But again, the fact that it just hit six month highs or whatever it is, is definitely a good sign for the bulls. Just keep that control, which they have been doing. Miners have space for daily lower highs, but the miners are potential weekly bull flags. So if the broader market bulls are able to bounce another couple of days and see 50% plus retracement, then it is possible that the, the metals stay strong and that the miners are weekly bull flags. An aggressive bear is gonna look to top fish, 37.22, 37.29, and look for a bearish entry off those levels. You know, if I'm looking bearish off those levels, I wanna see a gap up open tomorrow and then look to short off those levels.
but that's only the most aggressive bear. And again, in this current setup, I'm not looking to be an aggressive bear. I'm keeping an eye out for a bear position, but I need to see the dollar develop a bit more. Oil daily uptrend confirmed. Bullish inventory report reaction. Now we zoom out and we know that weekly resistance is up at 83.27, but this is the first time the bulls have confirmed a daily uptrend in over a month. I'm going to be watching this as just a little visual guide. And we'll see how long bulls are able to keep that daily uptrend going, heading back towards that 83.27 resistance. And with that oil strength, energy sector bulls also confirming the daily uptrend. Weekly inside bar bull break. So now we got a weekly higher low set. Low, low, high, higher low. And anything under 93.74 is just a weekly lower high. It'll depend on oil a lot. Definitely seeing the energy sector correlate with oil a lot more recently. But definitely one of our stronger sectors. Who else, what other major sector is at the highest level that it's seen in over two weeks? And the answer is nobody off the top of my head. What's the solar sector doing? Trying to set a weekly high or low but needs to see bulls follow through. We are anticipating weekly higher low is the most likely scenario. Bulls have tons of space to work with. And we got natural gas, trying to get a bounce going off of daily support, 5086, but four hour trend change, not confirming yet. We've got to get over 558 here. If we do, it's a four hour uptrend and the daily higher low will be set for the continued tightening daily range. So burden on bulls, but trying to shape up that four hour trend change. Cannabis names trying to get a daily bounce going. Bears are just salivating, waiting for the daily lower high, whether it's MSOS on US cannabis or CGC on Canadian cannabis. The broader market has a clear daily bounce underway and these names are still lagging behind, trying to follow suit, not nearly as strong. And again, daily lower highs are absolutely the most likely scenario here. And even the crypto names, coin, sideways, no daily bounce yet. So these are the weakest sectors in the market, cannabis, crypto names. And so on any broader market bounce, these bounces in these sectors are weaker. And so probabilities of being able to pinpoint a lower high are a bit higher. So I would use the broader market to look for signs that it's topping out, which we don't have any sign of that yet. But over the next few days, that's what we're watching for. And then transferring that information to potentially looking to short these sectors, keeping in mind they are certainly high risk, high reward sectors. All right. So you can be good at technical analysis and bad at trading. They're two different things. One is one doesn't have any psychological, well, doesn't have much, doesn't have any emotional impact. When I'm reading a chart and doing technical analysis, I'm imagining psychology. I'm imagining the bulls and the bears and what's going on with their psychology. But emotionally, you're not being impacted. And so it's completely different from being able to execute. I've always said that in my opinion, you know, trading is a team game, which is why we've got a chat room and we're working together. But I always thought the ideal trading team is like a three person team in the same room. You've got one person on news and social media You've got one person who's the technical analyst and you've got one person who executes the trades. And I think separating the person who does the technical analysis and the person who executes the trades is beneficial to simplify the process a little bit because the best technical analysis that I give is when I have no skin in the game, which is why I love taking ticker requests and you know have to... I mean, the vast majority of technical analysis I do on social media and in these videos, I'm not trading the name. And that's why it's an unbiased, I don't care if the, the healthcare sector goes up or down. It doesn't matter at all to me. So having zero skin in the game and zero emotional impact is a much less bias analysis. Anyways, today's trading, I was right with my technical analysis and the direction that I was looking, but I stopped out both times and ended up with a red day. And, you know, it was certainly a A-OK -okay red day by keeping my losers small by sticking to my stops. But I went for the Tesla bounce play today. 
And I liked the break of the low of yesterday, first thing with zero follow through. And so I entered long on this one minute candle bounce saying, okay, bear break zero follow through into a reversal back to the high of the day. I like that setup. That's very often how you put in a bottom. And then I was using the low of the day at that point, because obviously if we fall back to the low of the day, that shows us bulls lacking any follow through. So I end up stopping out there when the new low of the day is hit. And I didn't feel much FOMO when I realized, you know, that it was just one more lower low with no follow through into a significant bounce. This is really the move that I would have been looking for. You know, if we had shot up to 141 after my entry, I would have exited half and been risk free but I didn't miss much. It's not like the price went very far after that. Come on, trading view. So I didn't have FOMO or anything, but it was just too early. I, was, I entered one move too early. And so a potential fix for that would have been entering partial positions, scaling in. Okay, I'll make one half entry here at you know, wherever it was, maybe upper 138s, and I'll make a second half of my entry if we see a new low of the day with no follow through, and then I'll place my stop based on dollar risk. That gives me more maneuverability rather than just a one-off chance, all right? I'm in, if it hits this level, I'm out. And I did the biotech sector as well. I was looking for a 15 minute higher low after the relative strength, forgot to look at the biotech sector, we'll do that in just a moment. After relative strength all morning as a lead bull, 15 minute consolidation to EMA 12. So I scout a position knowing that a 15 minute higher low is the most likely scenario. And again, it was just in one move too soon. This is the move, this is the move that I got in on and I needed to see, I need to be more patient and wait for one more move down. And so I'm in and I stop out on that fresh low and then the 15 minute higher low forms. So the 15 minute higher low that I was looking for formed and played out. And the LABU saw 3% of a bounce from that 15 minute higher low. But again, the lesson, if I enter half there and then I wait, and if we get another leg down, I enter a second half. And then my stop is based on dollar risk that I'm willing to take on the trade. Maybe a half day loser, half of what I'm willing to lose on a given day before I pull the plug and call it quits, then that would have been much more maneuver, much more comfort maneuvering around. So that's the, the execution aspect of things, which is certainly different than the technical analysis aspect of things. And it was just one of those days where when you feel flow state in trading, which takes years before you will feel that because you have to have complete confidence and comfort, it's so clear when the opposite of flow state is happening. And today it was for me just so clear, like, no, you don't have it. You give me the same setup today and a different day, I'll nail both of those trades. It just wasn't today. And so I have to recognize that a newer trader or someone that has less discipline might be blind to that fact and say, oh, I just missed. I'm going to keep trying and I'm going to use twice the position size to try and make this back and still get a green day. Whereas someone who's put in a thousand trading days or 2000 trading days or however many it's been says, well, there's another trading day tomorrow. I don't have it today. The probability that I'm going to have no flow state and be the opposite of flow state and then find flow state midway through the trading day, it's not going to happen. If I'm feeling flow state, it's from the get go and I keep it all day. So self-reflection. All right. I'm done talking. XBI, nice follow through for the bulls. Two-day equilibrium, still shaping up. Key resistance, all about 84.18. And this is going to be a good one when it breaks. Next week, likely. Maybe this week still, but probably next week. Do we form another lower high and keep tightening up? I hope so. Tighter the better. Check out the link for Lamont's educational content. Appreciate you watching. Do good things and have a great Wednesday. So continuing onward, chapter three of our adventure started in Charlotte, went through Smoky Mountain National Park in as I was headed west, headed up to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky for this chapter, 
and also to land between the Lakes National Recreation Area between Tennessee and Kentucky with the goal of continuing westward towards Colorado. So here in Mammoth Cave National Park, that's my tent setup. I've got a very easy to carry light one person tent, lots of mesh on it, which I like because when I sleep without the fly on, it is great for you know feeling exposed and being out in the open and great for sunrises. There's my hammock. There's my pack. I think it's a 55 gallon or 55 liter pack. And I did have a mat at that point. The army mat that I was sleeping on was from my previous road trip where I learned my lesson, paid for a hundred dollar sleeping mat, and it was well worth it. So I, I unfortunately didn't have a good experience in Mammoth Cave, not because of this spider, that was a a nice little jolt in the morning as I went to pick up my bag. But the reason I didn't have a good time in Mammoth Cave is because it was June and it was the summer and ticks were everywhere. Literally every night, I would go back into my tent and have to take off all my clothes. I end up naked in every chapter. I guess that's the way it goes. I had to take off all my clothes in my tent and literally pick over a dozen ticks off of me every single day. And of course, I got most of them, but some of them did latch on. And of course, that's significant exposure to Lyme's disease, which is no good. So avoid these areas in the summer because ticks are rampant. I'm not, I'm not, you know, exaggerating when I say 10 to 20 ticks pulled off my body every single night uh, before I would go to bed. So these are some nice seashells that I found out on the area as well. This is heading towards land between the lakes, Tennessee and Kentucky. And there's a nice elk lady and they had this conservation area of 700 acres and it's pretty much giving you a taste of the animals that are to come out west as you continue towards colorado and towards wyoming and all these states they've got elk and bison and all that just out in the wild this was a conservatory so you could go in and drive around and check them out and of course the best part about road tripping or one of the best parts is the sunrises and sunsets they are everywhere <laughs> in terms of being frequent every day and it's great because they're so different so you have you know all these different landscapes and different cloud covers and just every single one so much different than the next and that was you know the highlight of the day oftentimes in terms of things to to look for and one thing that i love to do on these road trips was find a spot into the dusk because animals are most active early in the morning and in the evening at dusk and so if you find a spot at, you know, an hour or two before the sun sets and you sit there and you do not move, animals will interact as if you're not there. They obviously know you're there to a certain degree, but, you know, I've been able to, to sneak up on some animals just to see how close I could get. And I got real close to a baby elk. I'm sure I have a picture of that. But to be able to just be really silent and not move, nature goes on around you and then you just observe. And I love observing nature. It's one of my favorite things to do. And you know, people meditate and that definitely helps calm your mind. I would never sit out and intentionally meditate. The way I would do things is sit down and then just be still and let my mind completely react, relax and just you know, feel into the environment around me. That's my way of meditating and that's how I calm things down and stay you know, very even keel emotionally. And that definitely has an impact on my trading as well. So it wasn't, you know, this strict meditation practice. If you're living in a city or if you have, you know, surroundings where you literally need to, to lock yourself away to be able to meditate, that's one thing. But when you're out in the middle of nature, it's almost like forced meditation when you're the only person around and you're in the middle of this vast expanse. So that was chapter three. We're going to continue heading westward into tomorrow. And we'll check back in then. Have a good rest of your day.